This podcast contains graphic descriptions that some listeners may find disturbing. Listener discretion is advised. Now, with that being said, welcome to the Mortal Musings podcast. Right, let's do this. Remember that time you fell carrying the pizza up to the house? Okay, you can take that smile off your face for a start. And it wasn't pizza, it was Chinese. No, I'm pretty sure it was pizza. Megan, I had to pick it up. It was fucking Chinese. Okay, so I'd ordered a takeaway, right? Grand delivery guy rings, Neil goes down to get it. And we were just sat watching TV waiting for it. We were in great form, having, you know, having a laugh. <laughs> That's what we did. Yes, we do. <laughs> Neil goes out to get the takeaway, comes back, and the atmosphere has fucking shifted. I'm like... Okay, what the fuck's wrong with them? Okay. So I go to get drinks. I get like napkins. We're sat down. And then I just go, what the fuck is wrong with you? What happened in that like 45 seconds you were gone? And you're like, fell. <laughs> yeah. So. I fell. You got to remember it, it was pitch black in the winter. And I had to go all the way down to the driveway to get the takeaway. And the fucking steps, they've always got it in for me. And when I was coming back up, I toe pegged. What I can't remember if it was the top step or the second to top. I toe pegged that. Took off like a freaking rocket through the air. The food did. <laughs> the food scattered across the path. I went down. I, I bashed up my knee. My, my forearm were all scratched up and fucked. Mm. And I'm there in the cold, saw, picking up fucking takeaway, using the flashlight on my phone <laughs> to see where the food is. How, right, this is why I think it's pizza, yeah? I'm nearly positive it was. It makes more sense it was pizza if boxes went everywhere. If it was Chinese, the lids would have popped off, sauce would have been everywhere. I'm fairly certain it was Chinese. Are you 87% sure it's Chinese? <laughs> no, it, it, it wasn't funny. It fucking hurt. Because our, our path is gravel. Mm. Like, I, I remember we got being, it embedded in me. I... <laughs> See that? I was about to say, I remember being a kid and, you know, you fall and you get stuck in your knee or your hand, it hurt. Hurt like a motherfucker. But mm. you saying it was embedded in me leads the listeners to a different view, I think. <laughs> when I was a kid, my mate's little brother fell off his bike, like went over and all bars mm. and it got all like gravel in his gums. Oh my like, God. embedded into his gums. Ugh. Yeah. No, I don't need that in my life. So, um, what we're we doing today? So today is going to be a little bit of a uh, kind of a roundup episode of a few different stories to tell you on a similar theme. And okay. what we're going to be talking about is different cases of people who have lived with the deceased, just carried on living with a corpse in their home and the like. Okay. <laughs> you don't. You don't look thrilled. I'll be honest with you. For how long? Because Catholics uh, do it with open caskets and well, stuff. Well, there's a little bit of a difference there. You know what I mean? I'm not overly keen on that tradition, though. I find it a bit uncomfortable, like, just sat next to a dead body. Hmm. Have you ever been to a wake? No. Okay. I'm atheist, mate. But you could have, like... <laughs> I don't recognise anything you do, my Catholic best friend or whoever. Imagine that. Imagine you had a best friend who was Catholic and you're like, well, I'm not going to go to his funeral. Yeah. So the first story we're going to look into is that of Robert James Kufler. In September of 2016, in Minnesota, police received a call from a woman. She claimed that she hadn't seen her neighbour for over a week and had become concerned. So police head out to the home of Robert James Kufler and they enter the home and find... Sorry, just... just on that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, it just goes to show how different society is now. Because if you didn't work, someone could easily not see you for weeks. Easy. Mm -hmm. And no one would give a shit. Well, this is only 2016. Oh. She's you know, just a it's, good it's, person. It's a bit like, you know, uh, Peter Kay on his stand-up, he said something and it's so fucking true. He said years ago, if an alarm went off, it were like, oh my God, it's, it's the neighbor's alarm. Got to check on him. And then nowadays it's... That fucking tosser. Three days that's been yeah. going off now. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> you 
You don't. You become so desensitized to it. Yeah, it's like um talking to desensitized uh, hivers. It used to be like it stood out because it were only certain professions. What was no, 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 no. I'm going to everyone... argue with you on this. You keep saying this about the profession thing. It's about high visibility. Right, listeners. Please tell me you understand what I'm saying. No, I get what you're saying. Like you've I just got, don't agree. You, what? I don't agree. Someone who's walking on a fucking road at night and it's dark, the whole point is so you can see them, it reflects. You're not going to hit them with your fucking car. Yeah, but you know when I'm driving to work? Yeah. I see more people in high-vis fucking jackets or anything mm-hmm. than I do without. Yeah, but that you can see That might be them. someone riding a fucking push bike walking a dog and the dog's wearing one as well i know i get what you're saying i I get what you're saying i get what you're saying that if you were driving down the road and you saw someone in bright orange and reflective material Mm. you're like there's road works there's people blah 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 but high visibility is high visibility if someone's walking their dog like in the middle of winter when it could be 7 a.m it's it's not like super early but it's still dark out they don't get hit by a fucking car well, just agree to disagree. <laughs> I must have got wrong end at stick. <laughs> Fuck's wrong with you? He's got the wrong end at stick. <laughs> Fuck's sake. <clears throat> so back to the story. Mm-hmm. Uh, police head to the home of Robert James Kufler. They enter the home and they find... The bodies of his mother and his brother. But not him. No, no, he was still kicking. But he was, the call was about him. No. So a neighbour had called because they hadn't seen his mother for over a week. Oh, okay. So Robert had actually been living with the decomposing bodies of his family members for almost a year. Fucking hell. Mm, So that's horrific. I wonder why the neighbour didn't notice for so long because she said a week. And it was nearly a year. Yeah, so like 51 weeks, she was like, oh, Betty's just at the market. So not only did he not report the deaths, but he had actually tried to convince people that they were still alive. Oh, was this like a pension thing or? No. Oh. So during his unconventional living situation, he would claim that his mother and brother were in poor health and they couldn't come to the phone and they didn't want any visitors. Now, like you just said there about you know, the pension thing. Mm -hmm. He did not do this for financial gain. His mother and brother were still receiving social security payments and Robert never accessed their accounts. So what was his reasoning? Well, this is it. Because you you immediately go to financial gain or some sort of gain. Or can't let go. Exactly. Robert also didn't have any criminal history. Both his mother and brother had actually died in 2015 of natural causes. So, Robert was charged with interference of a dead body or crime scene. And he had actually moved his brother's body from where he had died. Okay. That's the whole interference shite. So, he fessed that up? I I assume so, yeah. Yeah, so it wasn't like they had died in their sleep and he just shut the door over in, like, you know, immediate state of denial. Yeah. But Robert claims that he was traumatised and he just couldn't bring himself to report the deaths. And when talking to the media, he asked, what would you do? I don't know. I haven't been in the situation, but I would probably report the deaths. Yes. What? What does he mean? I know. It's such a strange thing, but like, it does seem... Is he playing with a full deck? (laughs) By the time authorities had found their bodies, his mother Evelyn's body was extremely decayed and basically skeletal. And his brother's body was in a somewhat mummified state. Robert said, I am not some nutball. People think I am, but I'm not. I love them. Well, I think he is a bit. Well, in all seriousness, Robert was probably in urgent need of psychological treatment. Definitely. Now, this was something that the police captain, Dale Hager, said was actually part of the reason he was charged with the crimes. They wanted to make sure that through the courts, Robert could receive the help that he needed. So that's kind of a nicer side to it. Yeah. They're making sure he's going to get the help. Unfortunately, Robert maintains that he does not need any treatment for his mental health. And as bizarre as the situation is, it is believed that there was no malicious intent behind his actions. It was literally just that his family members had died and he couldn't deal. 
Hmm. See, like, you don't want to judge because, you know, it's like me and you, we've we've lived together now eight years. Mm-hmm. You you don't know if I were to wake up in the morning and dead. say you'd passed away in your sleep. Yeah. Dead, yeah. <laughs> you woke up dead. I woke up dead. You, you don't know. You don't. So, I'll tell you now, there are some... Because even, sorry, e- even someone has, who's very uh, competent, but to wake up and, and see you dead... Mentally competent, is that what you want to say? That's it. Yeah. So I'm I'm very mentally competent. Extremely mentally competent. But you don't know, if I woke up and saw you dead, something could just switch. What that can do to a person, yeah. Could just no, switch right. instantly. Mm. Now, I'm not going to lie to you, some of the people on this list... It is for financial gain. But in Robert's case, I read it feeling more, ah, Jesus. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it, it might have been one of them things. The longer he left it, the harder it was. Yeah. So obviously he didn't touch their accounts at all. It was not for that kind of a benefit. Yeah. The only bit that I don't like is pretending they were still alive. But mm. maybe that was trauma and denial. I don't yeah. know. So next we have Michael Eugene Sticken. Sticken what? 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 On the 13th of May in 2015 in Pensacola, Florida. Here we go. <laughs> police arrive at the home of 81-year-old Joyce Willis to perform a welfare check. So the police were called after her son Michael was reported to have repeatedly turned away family members after they'd attempted to call or visit his mother. Thing is, that's understandable. What do you mean? Just not be able to make contact? Or you mean him, if she hadn't been well? No, just turning people away. <laughs> he had actually been turning people away since January. And we're now mid-May when the police are there. Okay. So it's quite a while. Yeah, but again, that's not that long. If you think about how it is, this I, day and age. Yeah. Like, some of the happiest people I've ever met are the people who go to work, go home, and they don't socialise. They don't want anyone coming round. I get what you're saying, but it it might be more so, you know, because she was 81. You know, they're kind of a bit more... Yeah. uh... Now, when police arrived at the home, they immediately got a bit of a uh, whiff of something. They enter the home and they see two sofas which have been positioned directly next to each other, like... Like a double bed. Yeah, like turned into the backs are... So on top of these two sofas, there's just like blankets and quilts just piled up high. To cover up the smell. Well, yeah, basically. They walk over, they move the blankets and they find the horrifically decomposed body of Michael's mother, Joyce. The only problem is they can't immediately determine that the body belongs to Joyce. As the body is that decomposed, she's unrecognisable. Yeah. So the coroner estimates that Joyce had been dead somewhere in the range of one to four months. Michael insisted that he was not responsible for his mother's death, although he had been withdrawing money from her account. There we go. (laughs) Only one deposit had been made to Joyce's account in that time, and that was her social security payment of $1,400. Fucking hell. Is that a lot? That's a lot, isn't it? If that's for a month, it's not a... Why do I keep month... If that's for a month, it's not a lot of money, really, is it? Especially dollars, you know what I mean? If you were to convert that to euros, it's even less. It was enough for Michael, apparently. Now, all of that money had been withdrawn from her account. Okay. So, I'm not saying it's okay to do in any form, but it's not even like he dipped in to take a hundred quid to get food for himself. Mm. You know what I mean? Or whatever the fuck. So, Michael was arrested on charges of grand theft and failure to report a death. So what's what's the sentence for something like that? I'm not entirely sure, and I'm sure it would change from state to state, you know? Okay. Next is Dennis McCauley. On the 22nd of April, 2013, in Detroit, Michigan, officers showed up to the trailer where Dennis McCauley lived, and they were there to serve him with an eviction notice. So Dennis actually allows the officers into his home, and they're greeted with the unforgettable odour of decomp. And not just the smell, Neil, Mm -hmm. the sight of a corpse just over in the next room. They can actually see it. Why let him in? I do not know. I don't know if he was having a mental break or what was going on. Yeah. 
So the body in the next room was that of 72-year-old Anne Marquis. Now, Dennis is like, I, I didn't fucking kill her. Yeah. Let's get that fucking cleared up. And, you know, he didn't. An autopsy revealed that Anne had died of natural causes. And Anne had actually been dead for approximately six months at the time of discovery. And her body was described as, quote, partially dried out. Oh, yeah, because don't the, um, don't de- dead bodies, they start to, like, seep? Yeah, you will. Like, the different fluid. stages of decomp, it's mm. like, I think first it's gases. I th- I might be completely wrong here, but I think first it's gases and then the body starts to like seep and then it'll start to dry out and then it starts to decay. Well, that's literally how it was like partially dried out. I immediately went to, it was kind of that, um, you know, like we said about Robert's brother in the first case. Yeah. It like somewhat mummified state. That's the visual I got, you know? Yeah. There was also damage caused to her body after death. What, like... It dropped her trying to move her? Oh. Quote, when we found the body, the upper arm was separated from the right shoulder. It's right, so it, it's him moving her. Just, it sounds so... Yeah, but I don't know how brittle they are when it's a corpse. I'd imagine very. It's just, it's just kind of the... It's the bit of moving them after. Yeah. You know, like I said... It's to position them. you you got to remember, someone like it, he might be... Sitting her at the dining table when he's eating and then sitting her on the sofa when they're watching telly. When they're, when they are, when <sighs> he's watching telly. He might be putting her in bed. Well, see, you make it sound almost sweet. No. Like he can't, like he loves her so much and he can't well, move on. Yeah, it is that, but no, I'm not saying it's sweet. I don't think it was that with Dennis though. That's why this bit bothers me. Okay. So Anne and Dennis had lived together for about three years and... The trailer was actually Anne's, not Dennis's. Okay. Dennis was charged with failing to report a death, mutilation of a corpse, identity theft, among other charges. The prosecution claimed that Dennis didn't report her death for his own financial gain. They claim that Dennis cashed her social security checks, used her credit cards, as well as stealing her personal property. Now, what the fuck, Dennis? Like, you know, we said then about like, you know, is there a chance it's kind of the more like can't let go thing? Yeah. No, he was a piece of shit. Yeah, yeah. Their neighbour, Connie, said that she kept checking around to see if anyone seen Anne. Like, Connie was running the show, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. She said she had asked Dennis herself and he had told her that Anne had actually moved out three months previous. Now. Do you know what I think could be a good neighbour? Go on. Like, they'd know everything what's going on. Mm-hmm. Jerry, our Facebook admin. She'd be a right nosy bastard. Can you imagine her as your neighbour? <laughs> <laughs> when their neighbour Connie was asked what she thought of this, she said, quote, I think it's terrible living with a corpse. Now fucking hell, Connie, steady on, don't be too hard. For <laughs> fuck's sake. Now, this is our last one for today. Okay. Lynn and Kurt Ritter. And this happened on the 23rd of October, 2022, in Kansas. So, police arrived at the home of Lynn and Kurt Ritter. Uh, I will get into why the police were there in a minute. Okay. But when police got there, they found, laid in a bed, the mummified body of Lynn's 81-year-old father, Mike Carroll. Another 81. Now, back in the 90s, the Ritters had actually moved in with Mike. They were his carers and they were also financially dependent on him. Mm -hmm. So, you know, unsurprisingly, the police started to look at this as a case of suspicious death. But after an autopsy was performed, it was determined that Mike had actually died of natural causes. But we're back at it with the bullshit, Neil. They led his friends and family to believe that he was still alive. His niece, Janet, she said that she was denied contact with him. There was always some sort of excuse as to why he couldn't come to the phone or that she shouldn't visit. Now, his niece Janet, she lived in Iowa. So Mm -hmm. in case you're wondering why didn't she just ever do like a drive-by type thing and be like, what the fuck's going on? Yeah. Now, how long do you reckon this couple lived with the corpse of her father? Well, you said they were able to do an autopsy, so a decomp can't have been that far gone. Um... Yeah, like so far we've, the most we've had is a year and then we've also had six months, wasn't it? And then one to four. Fourteen months. 
Six years. And they were still able to do it. Mm -hmm. They were able to actually confirm the time frame because Mike had actually had a pacemaker fitted and they could see that he had stopped working back in 2016. So over that six year period, the couple had collected, you ready for this? Mm. $216,067 for Mike's pension and social security. It's not worth the smell. Well, by that stage, it would have been over, wouldn't it? They've, they've rolled it out and it's like there wouldn't be a smell anymore, would there? Yeah, but they've had to go through the smell. I'm absolutely not saying it's okay because they've like weathered the storm of <laughs> yeah. decom. They're still fucking bastards. Like, I mean... Megan's like, fair play to them. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that that's insane. Six yeah. fucking years and over $200,000. Yeah. I mean, pricks. Now, the person who actually called the police... You know, like I said to you, we'll get into that later. Mm -hmm. It was Kurt of the couple. Yeah. Yeah. Mike's son-in-law was the one who actually called the police to say that, you know, well, you've got his body here and we've been doing this. Why? I'm going to take a guess. Either his daughter, Lynn, was the one who really wanted this, or even if it was the two of them, Kurt couldn't live it anymore. He's probably like, this is, I can't believe it. It's gone on too far. It's been six fucking years. Yeah, maybe heat were coming on him a bit. Yeah. With questions of where, where the person was. I mean, it's for six years, yeah. lads. So they were charged with wire fraud and theft of government funding, which I don't know, un- unless it just wasn't included in the news articles. Hmm. Why weren't they charged with like interference of a dead body, not reporting a yeah. death or unless these were just the charges they, they didn't even go for the ones because they knew they could get them on this maybe. Yeah. Over 200,000 for fuck's sake. Yeah. Like that one's bad. But like, you'll probably, I don't know if you'll disagree with me. Like I wouldn't live with a corpse. No. Well, as far as I know, I wouldn't. Like I said, I I don't know if someone would snap in my head. But yeah, like that wouldn't be you. That You're not in the right state, you know. Why? Like I find, I, I can't understand it. Like the financial gain's not worth it. No, I can't get my head around if you're not in it for the financial gain. Why you should be charged? Because it's still breaking a law, isn't it? Why is it? Like, because I, you're not reporting a death. It could be, uh, you know, like that, like in a couple of the cases, they move the bodies. They're interfering with the scene of death and all, you know. I know you're you're trying to look at it from a point of compassion, aren't you? Well, yeah, like it, it's like the minute you're born, it's like, right, you have to register them. And then when they die, you got to register them. Yeah. You know, and it's like, why? Well, I, I don't, you know, we get to decide if it's burial, cremation, or what have you. You know, I, I just, I don't know. It's, and I know what you're getting at, like, but it, it's it's kind of just, yeah, the black and white thing of, it's, it's like, the law. would I, right, so say if you, say you snuffed it mm-hmm. and I, I was distraught. And I buried you in the garden <laughs> like you would a dog. No, no, no. Like say, <laughs> yeah. say I wanted you buried on the grounds. Put the little cross to yeah. mark it. Yeah. Say if I made my own like burial shrine in the back garden. Yeah. But I can get fucked for that. Do you know there are some places that you can bury on your own property? Now, I don't know if Ireland is one of them. Yeah. But yeah. No, but, but you still have to register and you still, That's yeah. what I mean. You have to go through all this fucking shit. What if I just want to dig a ditch, put you in, fill it? Yeah. Don't forget me cross a nice now. nice flower bed. Yeah. Roses, please. What? Roses, please. Not lilies. No, I, I like roses, I think. Yeah. I'd like roses. Blackens. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I do get you. You're coming much more from the side of compassion and we're humans and we're, you know. Yeah. But... We're not, we're not property of the government. Yeah, but you, you do understand the side of it as like, you know, from census and knowing what we need in our community and the infrastructure, we need to know who's living, who's not, yeah, and also yeah. in terms of payments. Yeah. Social, social security and the like. Yeah. <laughs> That's the cases of people doing shitty things with corpses. Yeah, I I enjoyed that. Like it's it's like when we did the modern mummies. I I enjoyed doing that one as well. 
it's kind of nice because obviously when you do a full on case, you kind of you're getting so into it, and it's all these horrible details. Yeah. Sometimes when you can just like, I'm not trying to downplay what these people did. It's horrific. Mm-hmm. But when you can dip in to a story here a little bit, yeah, and kind of you know. That's the thing with those episodes, but also when we do a mini, a lot of the times, because I can't get enough information, but I think it should be told. Yeah. So, there you go. So, uh, what you got oddity-wise? So, this is the story of Patricia Copta and her disappearance. Okay. For an oddity? Yeah. Oh, no, it's just going to be a quick, obviously it's an oddity. I'm not going to spend another fucking, like, hour getting into something else. Okay. So, Patricia was a woman who had been living in Pennsylvania and she was last seen in 1992. Prior to Patricia going missing, she'd been diagnosed with delusions of grandeur, and she was also told that she was showing signs of schizophrenia. So, Patricia had been missing for years, okay? Okay. 30 years in total. But after 20... Missing? Yeah. Didn't know where she was. For three decades? Yes. But after the 25 years, they, she'd been declared legally dead. And then she just, five years later, sprouted back up. She shows back up, Neil. <laughs> She's no quitter. Wait, so if she was declared dead, does that mean any any payments or anything? Like, she I, wouldn't guessing, have access to any bank accounts or anything? Yeah, so like her husband would, be, I assume, be able to get his widow's pension then. Yeah. And he can go and remarry and stuff. Without having to, like, otherwise he'd have to get a divorce on grounds of abandonment if he if yeah. he wanted to. So yeah, she, she shows back up after 30 years in a slightly different location. Being, what was she doing in Hawaii? Puerto Rico. It's a bit different. Pennsylvania to Puerto Rico, yeah. So, she turned up 30 years later in a nursing home in Puerto Rico. How did they not report her? This is the thing. Patricia didn't really share a lot of details. Okay. So down the line when someone had found her, at this stage, Patricia was suffering from dementia and the nursing home took her in as a person in need. So had they had her 30 years? Seven years after her disappearance, she was in the nursing home. So what was she doing for the first seven years? I don't know. I don't know if she was on the street, I assume, so they said a person in need. Yeah. I'm not quite sure. So, you know, like we said, she didn't really share a lot of her life in the nursing home. It was only in the last year or so that she had started to kind of give little bits of information that one of the social workers there could actually piece it together and call authorities. Yeah. So they did just that and they were able to get in contact with her family. And I don't even know how you'd feel if you were to get that call. Her husband said that he was just so relieved that she hadn't been murdered because, I mean, it will go through your mind, you know. And he had actually said that he suspected that Patricia could have gone to Puerto Rico as she used to hold her there quite a lot in her previous years. That wouldn't go in my mind at all. No, but I like that he thought somewhat positive that like... I, I would be thinking murdered or committed suicide by sea. Yeah, that's where my mind would go. Yeah. Uh, maybe it was like a coping thing. Like, I know she loved it there. I'd like to think she's out there on the beach having the crack. Uh. But yeah, that's a, uh, it's quite a wild story, don't you think? Like her sister did mention that as well. Like said, you know, she loved the ocean. She loved the beach and the sunshine. And it's just, fuck me. Yeah. Like it, nearly the same age as you. 30 years. For how mate. long she was gone. Yeah. Fuck. That's the, that's the story of Patricia who went uh, walk about for 30 years. Mm-hmm. Well, thank, thanks for that. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much for listening. Find us on Patreon, TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. If you have a case suggestion, or maybe even your own story, email us at mortalmusingspodcast at gmail.com. 